Uh, welcome. Uh, okay, well, welcome from, uh, from me, uh, Matthew, and uh, from Christian. We're from Jetstack. We're a, a company based out of the UK, so it's a pleasure to be here in San Francisco uh, and to present to you. Um, we are entirely focused on Kubernetes. Um, we've been founded for around two and a half years. Uh, we've been using Kubernetes since the very early days of the project, when you certainly wouldn't have got this many people in the room to hear about you. Um, things have become a whole lot more popular since. And we've been involved in the ecosystem, uh, making upstream contributions, um, various open source projects, uh, which you may uh, be aware of, and working in, in conjunction with major customers who are adopting uh, Kubernetes. Um, so today, I just want to just briefly begin with telling you a bit about Kubernetes. But I mean, before I do that, I might a little show of hands. Who here in the audience is using Kubernetes you know, quite actively? OK, so good, good few hands in the room. Uh, for those of you who are not, just a bit of a primer, really. Uh, so Kubernetes is all about sort of declarative uh, application uh, descriptions. So uh, in Kubernetes, the whole idea is that you want to be able to run containers at scale. Uh, Google have done this, uh, and they've done it with a system called Borg. It enabled them to take application workloads, declarative descriptions of those workloads, and then realize them on vast amounts of compute. Um, in this case, what they've done is they've actually, several years ago, open sourced uh, the way that they've uh, done that. They've learned a lot of the lessons of what worked and what didn't, and it went into an open source project that now is one of the most popular active, uh, and active uh, projects out there on GitHub at the moment. So this is all about kind of abstracting away the way that developers think about being able to realize their applications on compute. Uh, and we'll see there's various uh, abstractions, a whole number of resources in Kubernetes that you can use, some of which will uh, come up and show you. This is not just about being able to schedule, because a lot of people think Kubernetes is just about scheduling container-based workloads on compute. It's more about actually being able to manage uh, the lifecycle of that application. So it's about getting it to a node, making sure that it runs, but then actively maintaining it and monitoring it, scaling it, even auto-scaling it, auto-healing it. Um, so there's a whole bunch of magic uh, that's happening in this kind of master component. Uh, we're going to kind of delve a little bit more into that. But effectively, that's the best way, to, best way of thinking about it. One really important point here is that Kubernetes is infrastructure agnostic. So it's been built uh, using the likes of Go, uh, so it's cross-platform. It's used the likes of things like etcd, key value store, and it uses the Docker runtime. So it's using things that actually you can take to different infrastructure platforms. It is not a Google-centric uh, container scheduler or management uh, tool. It can be used on all manner of different cloud systems. Uh, and that's actually really appealing because you can describe your workloads using resources um, on one cloud platform, and you could strictly should be able to take that to another instance of Kubernetes running in another cloud, or even on-premise, uh, and get a very, very similar performance uh, and, and um, uh, an effect. So one of, what does this look like? Uh, where if anyone has actually stood up Kubernetes, they'll know there's a, you know there's a fair few moving pieces. So setting up a cluster um, has been, for some time, a little bit hairy. You know, there's, there's a whole bunch of things you've got to get up, and you've got to get them in the right sequence. So the things that we've got here are the control plane. So you can see here we've got, a, uh, we've got an API server. This is pretty much the heart. Everything talks to the API server. Uh, there's a command line tool called kubectl. You'll see this at the end when we demo. Uh, this, is, this enables you to talk to the cluster uh, effectively. The API server is backed by etcd, the key value store. Uh, and there's a couple of components that then hang off the API server that are responsible for actually realizing the state uh, that you declare. Uh, we'll talk more about this in a minute, but one of which is the scheduler. You know, how do I get my container-based workload to a node? Uh, and then there's a bunch of controllers as well, a whole number of controllers, uh, effectively control loops, which are responsible for watching on various resources in the API server and then actually realizing that in the cluster. Um, we've also got a couple of nodes hanging off this. Of course, you can have many, many nodes. Um, Kubernetes scales to many thousands of nodes. It's tried and tested at that scale. Um, and the nodes actually are pretty lightweight. They have an agent called the kubelet. Uh, they have a container runtime, uh, which by default is Docker, but interestingly is now replaceable. So you better swap it out for other runtimes, perhaps even a vir virtual machine-based uh, runtimes too. Um, and you've also got a proxy. It's responsible for getting you basically uh, through, uh, through the pod network. So how does this look? Well, one typical example um, of a resource is a replica set. Uh, important thing, point to stress here is the kind of actual and desired state. So I want you know, my application workload, in this case, uh, to start out running Nginx. I want to run just one of these things. Uh, we submit that resource. It's described using YAML over to the API server. And uh, at the moment, of course, there isn't actually one running. We've just got one that's desired. 
Oh, then kicks in is a controller. Uh, a controller is watching on the state uh, of the spec. That's the thing that we state. Um, and you now notice there's a status uh, stanza. This has been added by the controller. This is its way of maintaining the cluster side state, uh, the actual state. So in this case, we actually now realize, of course, we need to get a, you know, an instance running. Um, and the controller will, will do its work in order to make sure I mean, the scheduler, being one of the controllers, will make sure that it can schedule to a node and they can get that container running and report back its progress. So in this case, the, uh, the actual state has been updated to replicas one. We may, might go ahead like, at some later date and we might edit that resource and we can make it three. Of course, now our actual state is one. We need to go ahead and realize those two extra instances. Um, so in this case, the controller yet again kicks in. It's watching on the status of the resource and goes ahead and update, up, updates it. So yeah, probably a similar world to the one you're all used to. Uh, I want my state to look like this. Um, and you have a bunch of smart logic and controllers which can go ahead and actually realize it uh, for you. So in this case, yeah, I've requested three. I've now got three uh, effectively. So I said there's lots of moving pieces here. So provision Kubernetes has actually been, uh, for some time, has been a little tricky. It's become easier. The community has done really, really hard work to make sure that it can work pretty well and ubiquitously. Um, and you can actually bring it up rather quickly. Um, we've been sort of trying to focus on actually trying to get this to work at production and at scale and also to work securely uh, as well. So there's lots of challenges around this. So we've been through like several generations of building these things over the last couple of year, years. And what we really wanted to do is talk to you about those several generations and importantly tell you now about how we're doing it. So first of all, we're going to just tell you a bit about, oops, you know, tell you a bit about um, how this worked in the first generation. I'm going to hand over to Christian who, were, who built this for a roller coaster. Yeah. So basically, uh, you might have wondered why the title is from roller coasters to meerkats. We're going <laughs> to resolve that throughout the talk. Um, Basically, maybe two years ago now, um, I started investigating how you can scale out containers for a company that was doing the photography in theme parks, so the overpriced, low-quality shots you can buy there. Um, they also offered online. And basically, every processing was done in AWS, and it was slowly moving towards uh, container-based software there. And I was investigating a Mesosphere Marathon and ECS and Kubernetes, and I went with Kubernetes. I think it was around 1.0. And as the company was using CloudFormation a lot for setting up infrastructure there, uh, it was the natural choice. So the team was trained, and I was able to build it based on CoreOS as an operating system. So it, CoreOS is a really slim operating system. It comes with um, yeah, just a Docker runtime and like the curl and the, the standard commands you would expect. And basically, to glue all of that together, I wrote some, some Ruby scripts and some CloudFormation. At the time, I was not working with Matt, and so he basically um, had learned similar lessons uh, while doing his first Kubernetes deployments. So Yeah, this was broadly similar, and it was probably around about the same time. Um, so here we were using a couple of the projects actually open sourced by CoreOS. Um, apart from the fact that rather than using CloudFormation, sort of realized that we need to make things a bit more cloud agnostic, so we swapped out CloudFormation for Terraform. Um, this might be quite familiar for anyone that's been trying to stand up Kubernetes, kind of nodding of heads maybe. Um, this combination has been fairly popular for some time. Um, in order to get actually things working, we were using Cloud Init, Bash, typically. Um, yeah, things were not particularly pretty. I mean, pretty esoteric scripts to uh, stand up this that you know worked, but you know, it was rarely understood by anyone else. Um, we kind of introduced some shell scripting, some make filing, just to kind of wrap all this together so that we could actually run, operate Terraform, um, you know, get the various state files in the right place for different environments, um, kind of wrap this all up with Docker. And that last bullet it was actually helped by Christian when he joined. Um, so we kind of actually got to a pretty good state where we could maintain multiple Kubernetes environments uh, with different Terraform state. But the problem still remains that we had these kind of horrible shell scripts we were, <laughs> were pretty much responsible for standing up all the various Kubernetes components. Uh, lots of environment variables, lots of components you had to get working in. So a couple of the lessons learned from these couple of first, these first generations, I guess. One of which is you don't always want things to be immutable. So there's going to be some good cases, and Christian will kind of outline some of these, where you don't actually necessarily want to trash your entire cluster and bring up new instances. It can actually be really quite expensive. Um, so that was kind of one first good lesson, and we kind of learned that kind of the hard way, uh, really. And actually, these were relatively small clusters, and that was quite painful. So you can only imagine what it would be like when it's a lot, lot larger a cluster. We also realized that you know, the ability to test and the ability to debug 
um, the cluster provisioning and bootstrap is absolutely critical. So trying to develop this in, in Bash, you can only imagine the pain you go through in order to actually work out whether this thing works or not. Really, you've got to actually test it live. Um, and that's not always what you really want to do, particularly with per hour AWS pricing. You stand up these instances and pay the hour price. And I guess that's changed a little bit since. Um, also, all dependencies need to be versioned. I mean, anyone that's been using some of the early versions of Terraform will know that you know, going from one to the other cause problems, um, so that's some of which is in, it's got better, of course, with the recent versions of Terraform. But needless to say, actually, you need to build a version. So this was quite critical. Um, cluster PKI is really hard. Has anyone tried this for Kubernetes? It's all manner of different you know, CAs and different certs in different places. It's really, really quite hard. Um, we did a lot of this in the first couple of generations, just using typical OpenSSL, CFSSL, all client side, and putting it into various different secret stores. Um, it's not easy, though. Um, and actually, we had no kind of yeah, key rotation here. We had none of the good stuff that we probably should have had. Um, so that was one thing that we definitely recognized was not quite right. Um, and then also, we've got things, because one of the things we did learn, actually, is using the likes of Terraform actually is really, really useful, because you can start to abstract away the infrastructure. So actually, that was a really good lesson that Terraform actually was a, a pretty good tool. It was also used by a number of our customers. So this kind of all led us. Uh, really to sort of this next generation. And that's really what we're going to really talk, be talking to you a bit about. So Christian's going to talk to you a bit about some of the motivations that we had for some of the work that we're going to talk to you about uh, in the later part of the presentation. Yeah, so basically, um, one of the major pain points um, for us as developers and operators of the, the clusters we built before um, was the experience as a developer. And um, so basically, Matt already told, it's, it's like it was pretty long feedback loops. You changed some code. You might have forgotten a comma in a JSON or one too much. And um, you're just spending 10 minutes creating resources that are, might be quite expensive. <laughs> And then you have to destroy them later. And yeah, 20 minutes are lost. Um, while this 20 minutes, you start Googling around or reading Twitter or news. So <laughs> you're somewhere completely else. And um, basically, I think that was like early on uh, one of my goals to reduce that feedback loop. Having testability, I think, um, was, was um, quite a core thing for, for achieving that. Um, at the end, we started to look at um, bash script unit testing, but it's still not um, as good as I, as, um, I was um, used to from yeah, just writing code and not infrastructure code. And so, so basically, that was a core requirement for our product to have testability on every level. So we might have like unit tests for something, um, maybe like certificates that are really hard to do right, um, where we want to make sure that the rollover um, runs perfectly smooth without um, any downtime or without any validation errors. And also, like, we want to be able to test the whole integration between the various components that we're going to talk about later. Um, another pain point with bash scripts, they are quite unflexible. So you end up writing a lot of uh, code um, quite specific to the environment, the operating system, or even the Kubernetes version you're running. And once you change um, the Kubernetes version, you have to change all the operating system bash codes. Because with the lack of testability, it's not really easy to write a, a bash script that just works uh, yeah, across various changes. And so um, our new kind of deployment tool should follow like coding principles. So don't repeat yourself. Um, and also, yeah, abstract wherever possible and where it makes sense. So keep things simple at the various layers um, where yeah, we implement them. And um, also a major pain point was this kind of immutable um, replacement of instances. Obviously, immutable creates or solves a lot of problems. So you don't have to worry much about upgrading things because you just create them. And if they work, they work. And you try to migrate stuff over. But that also means if you um, have like a 20-node cluster, someone new joins, you want to add an SSH key um, because um, the new guy should have access with his own key then you end up rebuilding your cluster just because of a file changed on, on every of your nodes. And that can be quite painful. Um, obviously, you, you lose a lot of state caches, so everything has to be redeployed. It brings major risk, so 
just think of, um, so if you're familiar with the Docker's image registry, a lot of people are using latest tags, and then it just gets upgraded Then <laughs> when you do this kind of mistakes. Obviously, that has to be solved as well, the use of latest tags. But it's, it's something that, um, yeah, going to show up at the time when you upgrade. And you don't want to have, like, um, everything down and then still needing to figure out how to roll back the right versions that your application um, works. And, so basically, we want to have an ability to have this kind of desired versus actual state um, reconciling, like we have for replica sets, um, yeah, for, for our nodes as well. And I think a bash script that is running is really hard to, to do these kind of um, comparisons for you. And another goal for us was um, that we use like well understood tools. So. Um, Kubernetes provides you a way of running containers, um, starting certain applications um, under its agent, so kubelet on the node. And that is nice and fine, but when you want to find out the standard out or standard error of these containers, and it's maybe not a Docker where you can use Docker logs, then it gets really tricky to, to figure out what's going on. And also, if you have to send signals, restart certain daemons. It's not an easy way, so um, you have to break layers, use Docker for that. And so we basically f took a step back from what we have done with the CoreOS kubelet style deployments and went back to running binaries using systemd because systemd is well understood. It gives you a nice status. You can monitor it a bit easier. And you could also yeah, define dependencies between various daemons that run locally. And Basically, this, this, this kind of um, upgrade problem, I think I spoke already a, a lot about that. So, um, but um, using immutable infrastructure updates, um, we want to have like both ways. So there might be an upgrade where an immutable upgrade makes sense. So for example, a kernel upgrade, everything that requires a reboot or major changes between versions, you probably want to replace that immutable um, but like the small changes, minor versions, SSH keys, all these things, um, it's really, really helpful to have a less disruptive upgrade to just upgrade the file you want to or the daemon you want to replace and upgrade. And that helps you to run at a later point stateful applications, for example, in your cluster. So for most of the companies we uh, work with at the beginning, they run like their Node.js front ends, then they maybe switch a bit to the back end. And at the end, they tend to try to run databases, at least for CI and, and, and things like that. And all these things are um, having caches. They, they have a lot of state in them. And there's a huge risk um, with downtime. And yeah, that's the main driver for this less uh, disruptive upgrades. And also a huge problem is, so there are a couple of Kubernetes tools. So we just created another one. <laughs> but, um, all of these tools are quite focused on one platform. So for example, COPS um, or used to focus mainly on Amazon. Um, now it's supporting other providers, but still they use the kind of bash script deployment. So in detail, they, they um, are not really consistent what they are do on the node. And we wanted to solve that by running exact the same code on all the environments. And yeah, as I mentioned before, the kind of variations you have are like provider and infrastructure you run on, operating system, and also the version of components of Kubernetes, of Docker, of whatever else is involved into the, the whole um, architecture. And so basically, we looked at this from a bit far away, and we came out um, with the separation of infrastructure, configuration, and application. So um, basically, as in a cluster operator, you have to care about all three of them. Um, basically, infrastructure, you need to make sure you have your VMs provisioned, you have to have your hardware, you need some kind of internet access if someone wants to reach your cluster, you need load balancers, and all these kind of things. They are pretty provider environment specific. Um, and yeah, I think you can yeah, use this as a layer to abstract a bit. The other thing is the configuration management. So we want to run a certain version of Kubernetes. We want to run a certain version of other components. And maybe we have some flags to, to adapt for different infrastructure. But the main core concept is we run Kubernetes. And 
um, if we run Kubernetes 1.8, we have to have this flag set. And if you want to enable other features, then we have to have the, the other flag set. And then at the last layer is the abstraction that Kubernetes provides, the application layer. So everything that is an application, there could be like Kubernetes applications for, for the cluster itself that run like any other workload. But there could also be the user of the cluster. And that is written in YAML and just put to the Kubernetes API. And that should abstract from, from pretty much anything that, that sits beneath it. And so as a user of Kubernetes, as a developer of applications in a company that uses Kubernetes, you only care about the application. You use the same YAML files. And that's um, yeah, the thing you should be good at. And basically, for our tool, we looked at this um, three um, different yeah, layers and made sure that we used the right tool for everything. And yeah, I think um, if you look at, uh, there are various components that, that can differ between there. But at the end, you always have one cluster that provides you like the full stack. And at the end, you have the API where the user talks to it. Um, Basically, looking at these, these layers, we came up with Terraform for infrastructure. Because of the history of using it, we saw it really having good value for deploying infrastructure, for setting up instances, VMs, whatever. And then basically, at the end, uh, the Terraform provides us with an SSH access, for example, or some Linux box where we can run commands. Then for the configuration, we run Puppet. We might configure, like, this puppet has to set up Kubernetes on Amazon. And then we have a couple of settings that are Amazon specific. But the code base across all the other things is shared between all the environments we deploy to. And then at the end, we still can use anything that speaks to the Kubernetes API. So the core things are set up using Puppet. And then for applications, we support whatever the users want to do. So like. Setting up Helm is like a package manager for Kubernetes. So it packages the YAMLs for well-known applications, and you can reuse them and upgrade them. They are yeah, often in a quite good quality. And yeah, you can make use of someone else that is quite familiar with the application and the Kubernetes. And yeah, in the end, um, kubectl as well. And so basically, all these kind of things, they need a bit of glue to work perfectly together. And Basically, that is the thing that is on my t-shirt and that uh, Matt talks a bit more about. So we came up with Tarmac. And yeah, I'm handing over to you now. So this probably explains Christian's yellow t-shirt. Um, <laughs> uh, so we, yeah, we've just recently open sourced all, pretty much all the work um, that we've done here. Um, so this includes puppet modules, the Terraform, but also importantly, um, all of the, uh, the glue um, that kind of stitches this together. It's all been driven by the fact that we want to be able to provide a toolkit of all of those components to provide a really consistent deployment experience. And this is exactly what we've been hearing from customer after customer to customer, is that they want to deploy Kubernetes not just into one cloud environment, but quite often multiple environments. But what they don't want, this comes to some of the points that Christian made, is they don't want sort of a, a COPS cluster over here, something else very different on bare metal. Because then you've suddenly got an operations team that needs to understand the complexity of deploying and also maintaining this. Uh, those clusters. So we wanted to have um, a consistency. I think Christian pointed you through the various different layers. And we feel like we've got the right abstractions in the right places. Um, so this is kind of open sources, built from the ground up, as I said, to be cloud agnostic. Um, and it's pretty consistent and reliable across uh, different environments. And that's kind of open source. So let's work through the various components. Um, so the first stage, pretty much, in, in using the Tarmac tool to stand up a Kubernetes cluster is to stand up infrastructure, which is that kind of first layer, if you like. Um, this pretty much is all about setting up the, uh, the compute, the, you know, the virtual machines, the load balancers, the disks, the auto-scaling groups. Um, yeah, this is where we use Terraform, and the Terraform kind of really pretty excels uh, doing this for us. Um, so we've open sourced all of these modules. Um, you will build the various different pieces of infrastructure. Um, these will all have instance types, or the instance types, sorry, will have roles. So we can identify, in this case, etcd from the masters, from the workers. Uh, you'll also note we're using Vault and Console here. So we've uh, also using Vault to basically provide cluster PKI. Uh, and this is, all, this is all dynamic too. Uh, we won't talk too much in detail, but it's probably worth having a look at that if that interests you. Importantly here, though, um, once Tarmac has basically stood up all of the infrastructure, so it negotiates with Terraform on your machine. It's all wrapped by Docker. You don't need to care about having the right version on your client machine. That, that'll be worked out for you. 
Um, once we've stood it up, we then also take some puppet manifests and basically put them up into object storage. So we're basically creating here a Taji zip of all the puppet manifests, putting them up in this case on our AWS to S3. Uh, and you'll see kind of how we uh, kind of use this later. This is the point now at which once we've stood up uh, the infrastructure, the configuration needs to kick in. So we're here at PuppetConf, we use, we're using Puppet. Um, in this case, what we're using is actually something called the wing agent. So this is one of the components of Tarmac. It's a very, very small binary that sits on each of the nodes. It's not responsible for start on startup, uh, basically going to obtain that artifact that I was just speaking about. So all of the Puppet manifests get downloaded. Um, and based on the role, or based on the fact, you know, the machine obviously has a role, uh, we can then basically work out uh, precisely what this machine needs to run. So Wing is pretty much wrapping, if you like, uh, the Puppet agent. And we're using here the Puppet agent to do convergence of all of the various components. And you know, I think we've added as many as we possibly could squeeze into a diagram here. But you, hopefully you can understand it would be things like, for instance, the kubelet on the machines. It would be like the API server on the <coughs> master machines. It would be etcd or vault or console, whatever it might, may well be. Um, so that here, we're sort of almost like deferring to Puppet. We know Puppet works really well at this job. Um, we're using it for node convergence, and this is what it does uh, particularly well. So um, I'm going to pass over to Christian. He's going to talk to you a bit more about what this wing component um, does and how it works, and why, why we've used it effectively. Yeah, so um, basically, um, we have had a couple of projects where we used uh, Puppet uh, manifests um, for deploying Kubernetes. and. Um, we, we saw how painful it is to, to keep a master running, especially with like heavily changing, scaling up, scaling down, happening quite often um, of, of instances. Um, and so we just yeah, spiked a bit around how can we get rid of the complexity because um, I think we, we don't need too many of the features that the master provides us compared to what we already can do with a simple puppet apply. And so, yeah. Basically, what we come up with was um, like a simple daemon, as Matt described it, that just wraps Puppet Apply. And there's also some server component, which is providing an API server. It's the source of truth, let's say, for, for the status um, of your Puppet uh, cluster or of, of the cluster instances regarding Puppet Apply. And it follows the same principles like we had before, so the decide and an actual state. Um, Basically, the wing agent um, and API server, um, once I switch to the next uh, slide, um, you're going to see it looks quite <laughs> similar to whatever Kubernetes is doing. So um, I think that helps a lot because um, your team is familiar with the architecture of Kubernetes. And so it's, it's quite easy to understand what is going on and to debug things because Kubernetes has an etcd server where the state is stored. Um, and it also has like an API server, which we call Wing Server here. And, and pretty much um, the, the, the kind of API is compatible with the Kubernetes API, so you can talk with kubectl to the Wing Server and use all kind of things you know from kubectl to, to, to control um, what um, is going on in your cluster. And we use that for our command line provisioning tool to figure out in which state instances are if we need to um, yeah, push some stuff or how many instances we have, because that is completely disconnected from our information, because the auto-scaling group might just scale up based on CPU usage or whatever. So we don't know how many instances there should be. And so basically, Wing Server can tell us how many instances are online, um, the last converge, when has it happened, which, which hash of this manifests has been run. And basically, that works similarly like the replica set. So everything is a YAML in Kubernetes. Um, you can see here um, we have a spec field where we specify what we want to have. And later, we're going to see the status field of the actual node. So we're speaking here about instance A. And we want instance A to have hash of the puppet manifests FFAA, let's say. <laughs> and basically, all the kind of agents on every instance, so the wing agent will watch changes to objects that are named like its host name. And then it will figure out, oh, somebody asked me to converge to this hash. And basically, it will then update the status. OK, I've downloaded the manifests. The hash is matching. I'm converging now. And at the same time, it will fire off puppet apply. Um, once puppet apply has finished, 
it will yeah, give us some exit code. So if nothing has changed, exit code is zero. And then um, we can yeah, um, report back to our Wing API server that we converged. If um, basically there's some other status, it's going to retry a couple of times. It's backing off exponentially. And eventually, if something is really wrong, it's going to fail with state error, and it will also include in the status the error message or the output of, of Puppet Apply. And yeah, basically that um, gives us a pretty similar <laughs> feel to um, whatever yeah, we um, have in Kubernetes. So the desired versus actual state um, comparisons, just make sure to do the exactly right thing at a time. Obviously, it's a, the, the whole YAML looks a bit more complicated, so I, I cut it down a bit. Um, because um, basically we want to be able to converge maybe the same state, the same hash at a later time. Um, we, we also have the ability to, to request a dry run against some manifests with some URL and, and basically get the information back um, um, to the cluster. So um, let me see. So fingers crossed the demo is going to work. Um, So I hope everyone can see um, the kind of, I think it's big enough. So um, what we've built is this, this kind of Tarmac CLI. Um, one of the goal was also to, to make it run in a CI CD fashion. So um, yeah, for, for that we're wrapping pretty much everything and read the information from a Tarmac YAML configuration file. We're gonna see that later, so in the interest of time, so spinning up takes like, 10 to 15 minutes of a cluster, um, just because yeah, Amazon resources take a while. So this is a cluster in Amazon as well, worth mentioning. And basically, if I do a get notes, um, you can see I'm um, having like a sub command for kubectl, and that will make sure that my kubectl is configured the right way, because we don't expose um, the API publicly, so you need like a tunnel set up, and that is what happens um, within Tarmac. So it's setting up an SSH tunnel in the background and then make sure that we can reach the API. So now we can see our cluster. Um, there are five instances in it and the master is the one with scheduling disabled. And what you can see here, we have different versions um, for, for the nodes. And basically uh, 171 is a special node. We need the, the, this node to be at that version and all the other ones run on, on 177. And now we want to upgrade to 178. And what was necessary before um, was like you needed to replace all the instances. You need to make sure um, your containers move container by container from the old nodes to the new ones. And that was quite disruptive. And what we can do now, um, yeah, using the kind of tools so that Puppet provide us, we can now just upgrade it, the binary of Kubernetes, restart it. We don't have to touch our containers, so they keep running. Um, so to um, prove that, <laughs> we actually are able to, um, to, to run a con or the, the container keeps running. Um, I'm just gonna make sure, basically right now, I have no pod running with um, run equals ping, so that is um, um, the, the kind of command I'm gonna run shortly. No. There it is. So what we are doing here, we're not using a YAML syntax, we're just using um, a, the command line subcommands of kubectl to run a busybox image with ping to Google's DNS server. So that is the best thing I could come up. And basically, once I fire the command here against my Kubernetes cluster, it will create me a deployment, which will make sure that exactly one um, of these containers are running. And so if I look here, we can see nine seconds ago, um, this um, pod container here was created, and it actually um, is in a ready st and running state. So we are able to, to, to go to its standard out, and we should see there not too many surprises. P R U W F. And basically, yeah, Google is up. We can ping them, and no surprises here. Um, but um, what um, we're going to do right now, so I'm just, um, so basically I was quite lazy <laughs> and prepared that a bit. So I'm, I'm just updating the config. So we are here in the tarmac config file. 
And what um, I changed in the configuration was just the spec of the version. So we specify in here how our cluster looks like. And we have a global version. And what we see above is like the version for this one node. So you, um, if you remember the get nodes output, it contained one node that. Um, what, Can yeah. we take a look at the tarmac YAML file fully? Yeah. yeah. So, so basically, that is only the diff. And if we want to look at the tarmac.yaml, then we also can do that. So basically what we see here, that is the cluster object that specifies our cluster. There are a couple of settings. Um, but that is pretty much the default thing you're going to get. So tarmac has like a tarmac in it <laughs> to bootstrap a new configuration. And that is pretty much the configuration you're going to get here. Um, and before, we had version 1.77 here. So all the nodes are 1.77 by default. But we override for a certain group of workers. So we have um, one worker um, with a larger instance size um, that has, a diff has had 1.7.1. And we are now going to upgrade it to 1.7.7. So I just want to show that we are able to create multiple instance pools, we call them, um, with different configured instances here. And Basically, as the instances already exist, um, so we, we have changed the tarmac YAML now. And we can request a cluster apply command. And basically, I'm taking a bit of a shortcut here, because um, all the infrastructure is already there. And with an um, uppercase C, I make sure that I'm only running configuration, so the, the mid-tier, pretty much in my cluster. So I'm not running. I wouldn't create new instances now if I would have added them. I'm only making sure I'm asking Puppet to converge in my cluster on all the nodes. And that is what I'm doing here. So we now building. So um, the tarmac command contains all the manifests that tarmac ships with. Um, they're going to get built into a Puppet tar GZ. So it contains the hero data. It contains all Puppet modules we're using. And it contains. Yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> so no secrets in the Puppet Tar GZ. So they are coming from Vault. And, and basically, what happens then is the Puppet Tar GZ gets um, uploaded to some object store. Um, potentially, it could be, get uploaded to, to the Wing API server as well. And then the Win client's object, so the YAMLs, get updated with a new hash. And now they realize that um, they basically need, need updating. And, not too sure. So basically, if you look here, um, we can see how the output um, starts basically with making sure um, all instances uh, converge. And it starts with uh, five instances in state converging. It's because they need to download a new Kubernetes version. And then you can see five, still five. So it's taking, seems like a while. And then three instances in state converged, and five instances in state converged. And at the very end, we're going to see all instances. Let me just exit here. Yeah. And um, basically, now um, all eight um, instances we, we have in our cluster are converged. So if I do a kubectl get nodes, um, so I'm doing the pods first. So we can see the pod is still running. It's four minutes old. It hasn't been restarted, so restart count is zero. So that looks already quite promising. And also, if we do the get nodes command, we see um, all the nodes are on the latest release, 178. Um, yeah, all pods kept running. So, and basically, the one pod where we requested a slightly older version, for some reasons I don't know yet, um, yeah, are, are still there. Also, if we look at the log output, so basically, we can see there was no downtime. It's just pings like forever. So uh, also the network um, didn't get down <laughs> in the time where we were doing the upgrades. And yeah, so that basically was the demo. And just, yeah. And basically, how did we split the whole thing down into Puppet modules? Um, so basically, we decided every kind of application should have um, 
their own module. Um, we're starting with uh, Amazon module to mount um, persistent disks. Um, so the only place in the cluster where we have state is Vault and um, is etcd. And on these nodes, we mount persistent disks to make sure um, that we keep the state across instance replacements. So ABS, EBS, uh, AWS EBS module is setting up a systemd unit that mounts the disk. If the disk is not existing, it's formatting it. And then at, yeah, yeah, at the very end, at the shutdown of an instance, it also makes sure it gets detached. Um, then we um, have, um, yeah, probably Calico is a network plugin for Kubernetes. Um, we plan to support more. Right now, we are quite happy with the, the kind of scale Calico runs at. So uh, we were testing it up to 250 nodes um, with the kind of default set. And from then on, you have to make sure that <laughs> um, everything gets tweaked a bit. Um, and basically, the etcd one sets up your etcd cluster. Um, we have Kubernetes modules, obviously, for the Kubernetes, Kubelet, com um, API server, all the components of Kubernetes are in subclasses there. Um, we have Kubernetes add-ons. So basically, um, if you remember the application um, layer, there is a way to yeah, deploy it using Puppet. And there would be also a way deploying it um, via Helm, these Kubernetes add-ons, because they are actually only Kubernetes YAMLs that get pushed into the API server. And so I think if users want to customize them, they most of the time tend to not use the Puppet modules because then they have to change Puppet, which not so many people are familiar with, than uh, just with the YAML files. Um, we also ship with um, a Prometheus standard rule, so um, we are monitoring the system components of, of the Kubernetes cluster itself from within the cluster. So basically, it's a good practice to monitor in the cluster, but you should also have some Prometheus somewhere outside of it, just to make sure that not the whole cluster um, went bust and you don't get any alerts. And then we have a tarmac model that bundles all these models together, configures them in a way like we want them to be configured. And, um, we, uh, and one of these things that Tarmac configures is a Vault client. So Vault client basically ships a binary that makes sure that certificates are going to create it properly. So let's say keys are generated locally on your nodes, and then a CSR is formed, is sent to Vault. Um, the, the Vault um, kind of identity that your node has matches exactly your cloud identity. and um, and that all is used for XCD, for example, and Calico needs certificates. So pretty much everything needs certificates once you want to make it <laughs> at least a bit secure. <laughs> and um, so we can reuse huge parts um, of this Vault client pretty much everywhere where you need um, certificates. And that was pretty handy and compared to like um, the bash script really, really easily to handle once you've written the, the hard pieces in Vault Client. So the complexity is in Vault Client, and we just use it and um, pass the paths through to the other ones. Um, so the next thing. So basically, now you might wonder, so we learned about roller coaster, but what about Meerkats, Matt? Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so it's, it's probably worth uh, mentioning. We've basically been working with um, someone called Compare the Market. So if anyone's from the UK, they'll probably know Compare the Market is a, a kind of basically a, you know, a kind of comparison site, effectively. So we've worked with them for several months. So they've helped us using to build some of these puppet modules, which, which we're open sourcing. Um, that's now live in production. And there's also a pretty major travel comparison website, again, that we've been working with over the several months that are also using these in production. So we're kind of really, really happy to hand all of the work we've been doing. It's many, many months um, out into the open source. And hopefully, you might find it interesting. You might even want to get involved. Um, so it's, it's gone up on GitHub about several days ago um, to Jetstack slash Tarmac. Um, we've put some docs together. I think we're going to continue adding to those docs. But we're really just interested for people to go and have a look Go and have a look at what we've done. There's some Go here. That's what wraps everything together, the Puppet modules and Terraform. Um, it gets you some pretty robust Kubernetes clusters um, on AWS at the moment. But we're actively working on uh, GCC, GCP support and perhaps even Azure as well, um, and perhaps even some on-premise bare metal with some of our customers. So if it's interesting, please come and find us. Um, please contribute. It's really, really useful. Um, and thank you for, uh, for being here for 45 minutes. And uh, hopefully it's interesting. Thank you.